Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Raise the Vibe with Liz. I'm your host, Liz Peterson, and today I have Dr. Jan Holden joining me today, and we're going to be discussing near-death experiences, a topic that I've always been fascinated with is near and dear to my heart. I had an experience um, when I was younger in 10th grade where I woke up in the hospital, and the last thing I remember is a conversation with my grandmother saying it's not your time yet. So I've always been fascinated and can't wait for this discussion. And for those of you who don't know Jan, Dr. Jan Holden, after earning her doctorate of of education degree in counselor education in 1988, her primary research focus has been near-death experiences, after-death communication, and other transpersonal experiences those that transcend the usual personal limits of space, time, and identity. In this research area, she has over 50 referred journal publications and over 100 national and international presentations. Dr. Holden currently serves as president of the International Association for Near-Death Studies, and since 2008, she has served as editor-in-chief of that association's peer-reviewed scholarly journal of near-death studies. Jan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Liz. I'm happy to be here. So great to host you. So let's, I want to jump in a little bit. And I know I said a little bit about your background, but what was it that brought you into near-death experience study? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, I had always been uh, interested in phenomena that were hard to explain, like uh, psychic experiences and things like that. So I'd read about them growing up. And then in uh, around 1970, uh, I was at home from college and my father read a book called The Great Soul Trial. And it is a nonfiction book about a miner who disappeared and in his safe deposit box, the state of Arizona found uh, several hundred thousand dollars. This is around 1960. Uh, and a little note saying, a handwritten note saying that he wanted the money used for research on the survival of the human soul after death. So the state of Arizona um, put a little ad in a paper, and to their surprise, over 100 individuals and entities came forward to uh, claim this money. So the state of Arizona had to hold a trial where a judge heard all these people testify how they would use the money And among them were the um, research directors of the American Society for Psychical Research and the Psychical Research Foundation. So that just really piqued my interest about the idea of legitimate research on the survival of the human soul after death. Then in 1978, I read Raymond Moody's book on uh, near-death experiences, Life After Life. And then in 85, I was starting to plan my dissertation for my doctorate. And long story short, on that account, um, I ended up doing it on something related to near-death experiences. And I've just been enthralled with them ever since. And because near-death experiences include other phenomena like out-of-body experience, after-death communication, past life memories, um, that uh, it's led me into research in some of those areas as well. So that's what I've been doing for the past 30 plus years. Oh, that's awesome. And you know what, when I hear NDE or near death experience, I didn't realize that those other things that you mentioned were also part or thought of as part of that experience. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, as you said, you, you re- recalled a conversation with your, I assume, deceased grandmother. Yes. Yeah. And so that's after death communication. You were communicating with her after she had died. Um, So, yeah, so that's um, and uh, sometimes people have uh, their near death experience includes um, perceiving the material world from a position outside their body. So they have the sense that their consciousness is functioning outside the body, perceiving the material world and or perceiving and interacting with Uh, environments and entities not of the material world like your your deceased grandmother oh that's so fascinating I even Mm -hmm. recall um when I was around 21 I was in a pretty severe car accident and um pretty bad concussion that had me out for a couple days and I can remember just for a brief moment that 
feeling of being outside of my body watching that experience. Yeah. 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 So how does that compare to the near death experience? What are the similarities and the differences? Well, um, I think one of the important things uh, for people to know is that a near death experience is not the same thing as a close brush with death. Uh, The media confuses this all the time and calls any close brush with death a near death experience and it's not. Um, About 90% of people who survive a close brush with death um, don't remember anything unusual. And so that's just a close brush with death. But about 10% remember um, this experience of their consciousness functioning while their body was physically um, out of commission, either usually unconscious, uh, sometimes actually in cardiac arrest, Um, although someone doesn't actually have to even lose consciousness to have a near-death experience. Um, But the features are that the person... um, perceives, uh, some people experience their consciousness leaving and returning to their body. Others don't. Uh, Those who don't, uh, they're just suddenly aware of either uh, being out of their body, looking at the material world, or being in a transmaterial environment, uh, usually communicating with Uh, entities such as deceased loved ones or spiritual entities, Um, sometimes identifiable spiritual entities, sometimes not. So any and all of those can be uh, part of NDEs. Everyone's near-death experience is unique, and yet if you look at um, large numbers of them, you start to see these patterns that uh, everybody's experience includes some combination of these various uh, elements. Wow. Do you have some research studies that you could share with us? Because I find it really interesting that you said that the person doesn't have to pass on right. to have right. had this experience, that they could have it without the body actually starting the death process. That's right. That's right. Well, for example, um, Uh, People have reported near-death experiences uh, in falls, in uh, uh, mountain climbing, and in some cases, when they landed, they weren't even physically injured, but during the process of falling, they had the the near-death experience. People have had them uh, during drowning when they um, actually may have not uh, a, a lot of times they do lose consciousness, but not necessarily, and still have the experience while their body's underwater, they have the experience of their consciousness separating from their body. So, um, so yeah, um, I would say anyone interested in research, a good place to start is the 2009 Handbook of Near-Death Experiences, because in it, even though it's now like um, about 12 or 13 years old, um, it reviews all the research that had been done on NDEs between 1975 and 2005 or six. Um, And so those first uh, 30 years of uh, investigation are reviewed in in that book. It's it's more of um, uh, an academic book Um, And for somebody who's um, not as interested in quite so academic an approach, I often recommend Ken Ring's book, Lessons from the Light, uh, in which he, um, with his co-author, Evelyn Elsacer Valerino, um, review the basic features and after effects of near-death experiences. And we haven't talked about after effects, but that's another, there are two big areas of research in the field of near-death studies. One is the experience itself, which we've talked about a little bit. And then the other is the after effects, which are documented um, for um, near-death experiencers. Awesome. We'll have to come back around to that. But first, you mentioned the consciousness leaving the body. So what do people describe as a consciousness leaving their body? And what are some of the um, things that follow that? Well, um, the the main overview point is that there is no one way for consciousness to leave the body. Some people will say that uh, it just rose out of their body uh, on on the whole. Some people say that it left their chest. Some say that it left their 
forehead, some say it left through the top of their head. So um, it's, it just differs from person to person. And the same thing with re-entry is that it can re-enter in um, different ways. Um, so um, yeah, and uh, I would say that, that about half of near-death experiences include a specific memory of leaving and or re-entering the body. Yeah. yeah, and then when they're leaving, before they, or when they have left, before they re-enter the body, what are some of the stories that people share around their near that death experience? Like, what are they seeing? What are they feeling? Yeah, so um, in the, um, there, as I said, there are these two kind of aspects to the experience. One is what I call the material aspect, because the person is observing the material body. Usually it's the area surrounding their physical body, and they're seeing like if the body has gone into cardiac arrest, they see the medical team scurrying around trying to restart the heart and, and all of that. Um, if they're uh, just in the middle of surgery, they'll be outside their body looking at the surgical situation. Um, and, uh, the, and perception in the out-of-body state, it turns out is actually quite similar to perception in body, except that there are additional things. So in addition to, you know, your gray and uh, off-white top, striped top, looking like a gray and off-white striped top, um, they can both see and see through physical things like walls and uh, actually move through physical um, barriers like walls and doors and things like that. They just move through them. They can telepathically know what the people they're observing are thinking. Wow. They, because they can travel away from the scene where their physical body is, they can perceive um, events that are going on away from the body. And um, they, they often talk about having a global vision. That means like right now, I only can look forward, you know, I can't see my hand back here, but if in the near death experience, there's perception in every direction because there's no impediment. And so I, of course I would not have a hand, but if I did, I'd be able to see it back here. So, so I call um, the perceptual ability in the out of body state perception plus, because it's normal perception plus um, additional things that we don't have during physical perception. Um, sometimes the person uh, doesn't immediately recognize the physical body that they're um, perceiving. Um, and usually they're in a location above. And if, if they're in, happen to be in a room, often it's from a corner. Um, and they may not recognize the physical body as their own until they're kind of looking at it and thinking, oh, that poor girl, she looks like she's in really bad shape. And then kind of go, wait a minute, that's me. No, this is me. Oh, I must be dead. So um, the realization can um, come on, you know, fairly um, gradually. Um, other people recognize the body right away. Um, so those are some of the features of, of perceiving the material world. Is there anything that you've wondered about within that particular aspect of the experience? Yeah, I'm also wondering about, you know, the people that talk about they're in the tunnel of light or right. you know, they feel like they've left the planet or they're right. visiting with their loved ones. Right. So this is the, the other aspect of the experience that I call the transmaterial aspect. It usually begins with rapid movement through some uh, either an enclosure or it could just be open space. As, uh, often, but not always, it's described as the tunnel, but even then people describe the tunnel differently. Some will say that the tunnel is dark and there's light at the end. Others will say that it's light. The tunnel is light with a brighter light at the end. Um, and as they move through this um, uh, enclosure or space toward, usually toward a light. As they approach the light, they discover that the light is actually an entity, it's a being. And, um, and they communicate telepathically with, in fact, all communication in the transmaterial aspect tends to be mind to mind telepathic. And um, in terms of communicating with the being of light, people 
perceive this being to be all knowing, all loving. So they feel completely known, completely loved. It usually feels very familiar, even though they don't remember specifically, they just know that they've been here before. And, um, and many people report this experience as coming home. And a lot of times they'll use capital letters, H-O-M-E, like they feel just absolutely um, comfortable in this place. And um, sometimes in the presence of the being of light, people uh, have a life review. They review and re-experience uh, typically every moment of their life, typically uh, in a chronological order. But the, there's a special feature where the person experiences being on the receiving end of all their actions. So like mm -hmm. theoretically, what near-death experiencers would say that one day you and I will relive this moment and I will know what it is to be you. You'll know what it is to be me because right. um, there is no separation. And so, um, so one of the big takeaways that happens for near-death experiencers is so after the NDE, they realize that everything they do, say, even think um, that could have an effect on another person, they're actually doing to themselves. And so it's a very profound, um, probably the, the single most significant um, aspect of the of the near-death experience. Um, and then some people have, uh, and, and again, remember that not everybody experiences the light, maybe um, a third or less than a third of people. Um, some people and or uh, experience communication with deceased loved ones. And usually the message is what you experienced with your grandmother where the loved one is, and sometimes the being of light will be the one or another spiritual entity will be the one to say, it's not your time, you know, you, you can't go forward. So there's some kind of barrier, it, it might be a natural barrier, like a person may have, uh, be perceiving a beautiful earth-like environment, except that it is, there are colors that they've never seen on earth, there may be unearthly music and things like that. Um, but they may see that there's like a um, a passageway through a mountain, and they know that they can't go there, and that beyond that, they wouldn't be able to return to physical life. So it isn't always an entity who tells them. Sometimes it the the barrier presents itself in in a different way. But that barrier, uh, some um, point beyond which the person wouldn't be able to return, is a, a common theme. And um, and as I said, many people are told that it's their time to return. Sometimes they're fine with that. Sometimes they're not. And um, uh, so about half of people are given some choice about whether they want to return or not. And they might actually be shown um, what life will be like for their loved ones if they pass and shown that eventually everybody will be okay. Um, but also shown what life will be like if they return. In those cases, people, um, when they return, virtually always, if not always, they return because of a love relationship. They, they think of someone who's alive, who needs them. And, um, and in the moment that they have that empathic sense of, you know, that this person would really be in bad straits if I didn't return, boom, they're back in their body. Um, and then about half of people are not given a choice. They, um, they might uh, be told it's time to go back. They don't want to go. They'll argue. And um, as one near-death experiencer, Kimberly Clark Sharp, she said she was arguing with God. And she's like, no, I won't return. And he said, yes, you will. And he, she said, no, I won't return. And he said, Yes, you will. And she says, you see who won. <laughs> so, um, uh, but some people are just tooling along in their NDE and suddenly it just stops and they're back in their body with no um, warning at all. So it just can, again, vary from person to person. God, that is so fascinating. And I love what you were saying about getting different perspective 
in mm-hmm. the post-death experience, yeah. right? Because I really feel like life is about always coming to another perspective as mm-hmm. you get older and you experience more in life. And so fascinating, the stories that people say, you know, they're seeing their life review, they're getting a different perspective, mm-hmm. you know, from the other person's point of view, or even the worldly perspective or global perspective instead of just the singular focus perspective Mm -hmm. that's so fascinating yeah right right Mm -hmm. so yeah and I've also heard you know people feel like they feel love you -hmm. know can you talk a little bit about that like the feelings that people feel and not just the visual experiences yeah well as I said uh especially in the presence of the being of light or in the presence of light in general people report that the light is love and uh, they often come away from near-death experiences uh, believing or they would say knowing that the essence of the universe is love and um, the the suffering that we experience in life has a lot to do with our separation from the the reality of the essence of of life so um, so love is a very big um, aspect and uh, people come away from NDEs believing that, um, in fact, the purpose of physical existence is for each of us to ex- uh, expand in our capacity to love and also to acquire knowledge. So I say it's loving and learning, but but in that order, loving first. Mm-hmm. That's great. And mm-hmm. fascinating that they feel the love and the learning and previously in what you said that it's the love that brought them back into their body yeah exactly exactly right (laughs) yeah I love that and I also love what you shared at the um, end of the last thing that you were saying where you know she said she was arguing back and forth with God and God won and I love that because you know we often wonder you know in life like is it a choice? Is there a purpose, you know, why we're here? And that could be like a little wink into, no, you have more to do. You do have a purpose here on yes. earth, you know, that you need to serve. What do people talk about that, you know, after well, this experience? Yeah, it is. It is a, a sense of uh, people do come away with the NDE with the sense that their life has purpose. Um, people, interestingly, who had a near-death experience in the context of a suicide attempt, Um, also don't experience judgment or any of that um, negativity. But what they do learn is that uh, if they succeed in killing themselves, they're just going to, they perceive, be reborn and face the same challenges that they're facing now. So it's kind of like dropping out of school. Whenever you get around to reentering, you come back to the same grade that you were in while everybody else has moved forward. So it just is self-defeating not to um, just go ahead and and face the challenges that life brings us and use them as lessons for advancing in our capacity to love. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's intense. And I really have felt that I remember a low point, you know, kind of a hopeless kind of sensation in my late teens, early twenties and thinking, oh God, you know, this planet is so hard. Sometimes I just think about like checking out, right? And I'm like, if I did, I know I would just get reborn again. So I might as well just keep living this one, right? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. hear that. that Exactly right. So how did you know that? Um, Had you learned that from some external source or do you think it, it was sort of wisdom that came along with having had your near-death experience? Gosh, that's a really good question. In the moment, it was just like an inner knowing that just came on me that, oh gosh, you know, if that's a choice that I made for myself, I would just end up incarnating back into another life. So what would be the point, you know? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It was just like sort of a knowing that came over me in the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Yeah, that's fascinating. And I've 
always contemplated it too. My biological father committed suicide just before my 18th birthday. And I always wondered that circumstance, you know, when people do take, and I know there can be a variety of circumstances. I really don't think in life and death, there's always one way, you know, mm -hmm. one right or one wrong, you know, situation, yeah. right? But certainly like that was a possibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh-huh. And, and uh, you know, as I mentioned, the uh, really, um, I think, important aspect of what NDEers uh, say, suicide NDEers, that they, they weren't judged for what they, what they did, and they weren't, like, threatened with hell or anything like that. Uh, they were just shown the consequences of the choice, uh, but um, that, wow. that those consequences wouldn't involve any kind of damnation or anything like that. Just, a, you know, kind of like if somebody, if a child makes a mistake and then you just lovingly redirect them back to, you know, do, getting it right. And so, um, so that's, that's sort of the, the way, you know, um, one of the, I, I would say of all the near-death experiences that I've um, heard and talked, you know, to so many ND ears and so forth. One of the things that uh, probably sticks out in my mind the most is an is a, a moment during the near death experience of Anita Morjani. Uh, she had an NDE um, when she was uh, in end stage lymphoma, and she was down to like seventy eight pounds and and unconscious and covered with these sores and. Uh, her and her organs were shutting down. And she had this profound near-death experience involving both a material aspect, seeing her body in the, in the hospital and the people that were there and seeing her brother arrive. And in fact, she saw him leaving on the plane, you know, hundreds of miles away and then all the way to seeing him arrive and so forth. Wow. And she also had a transmaterial aspect where she was communing with spiritual entities. And I think at this moment, she was with her father, her deceased father, they were um, ov over the hospital situation. And, uh, and her, I can't, but that may not have been her father, I'm not sure, but it was a spiritual entity uh, accompanying her. And, um, and the entity said, so now it's time for you to decide if you're going to stay here, or go back into their body, that body. And she was kind of like, go back into that body like is that even an option and she said didn't they just take a a blood sample and and won't that determine whether my body lives or dies and the entity said to her the decision you make in this moment about whether you're going to live or not will determine the outcome of the blood test wow so so we often think that the material world is fixed and, you know, it's very causal. Um, but what she learned in her experience is that our attitudes, beliefs, expectations, um, and, and not just the superficial ones, but the deeply held ones are um, actually have an influence on the physical world. So, um, so that was, that was pretty mind blowing to me. Yeah, that is mind blowing. And I hadn't heard that aspect of her story before. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, sure. Oh, you that's bet. So powerful. Yeah. <sighs> what happened with her would determine the results of the blood test. Yeah, what she decided wow. in terms of her, whether she wanted to live or live physically or, or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It really makes you stop and think about you know everything that you would um project onto a situation mm -hmm. like, exactly yeah and the ears tend to believe that uh even our thoughts are very powerful um even those that we don't share with other people still have an energy and a an intentionality about them that can have an effect on the world so um so much of life is about learning to manage our um not only our actions but and you know in our words but all, but even our thoughts yeah. yeah 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 i know one one thing that i've experienced sometimes i empathize with someone who's having a certain physical problem 
And, uh, and within a day or two, I'll start to manifest those symptoms. And now I've, I've learned to catch myself. So when I empathize with somebody, I, uh, when I'm like finished empathizing, I say, let me make it clear. I don't need to experience this. You know, I'm just sorry for them <laughs> to save right. myself from. <laughs> yeah, I love that differentiation. And that's a really good tidbit there. That yeah. would be great for empaths and yes. that really pick up on other people's things and kind of take them on. Exactly. Right. Yeah, we really need to know how to set boundaries and, and maintain them. Yeah, to maintain our own integrity. Right. Yeah, right. Maintain it without taking yeah. it on. Oh, I love that. So it's it's um, not hard to imagine that an experience like this, which, by the way, our culture does not prepare people for the possibility that this kind of thing can happen. So uh, when it does, most people are caught completely unaware Many people don't realize until sometime after the experience that that was a near-death experience, which when they realize it, it helps to understand, you know, what happened to them because it can just be very disorienting. But, um, but people are changed by these experiences um, profoundly and long-lastingly. There have been studies um, following people decades after the experience and finding that the changes that they've manifested have have maintained, if not deepened, in many cases, some things fade, but many things uh, remain and many changes remain and even um, expand. Um, so I like to categorize the changes as psychological, spiritual, physical, and social. So among the psychological changes, people absolutely lose their fear of death they know from experience that their consciousness is gonna continue when their physical body doesn't. So they have nothing to fear of death. Now they still don't wanna have a long painful dying process, mm -hmm. but death itself holds no fear. Um, they lose their um, materialistic um, attitude. It's such a big thing in Western culture. Um, and it's not that they don't enjoy material things, but they just don't have the attachment to them uh, that many people have. And, um, and they uh, lose ambition for things like fame and, um, and um, you know, the, the best paying job and that sort of thing. Um, and conversely, they tend to value um, caring for others more and, um, and so we'll talk about how that manifests in, in social things uh, in a minute. Then um, spiritually, now that's not all of them, but a couple of highlights of the psychological changes. Spiritually, people tend to become much more interested in spirituality. Most near-death experiencers, if they were affiliated with organized religion, leave it, not because they are against it, but because religion just isn't big enough to account for what they experienced. And religion sometimes can become very orthodox and lose the connection to love as a fundamental principle. And that just doesn't fit for near-death experiences. Now, some get more involved in religion, but like I have a friend, Michael, who became a deacon in the Catholic church um, some decades after his near-death experience. The first, um, I was there to celebrate with him and I heard his first homily and it was on near-death experiences. So, you know, it's still very fundamental to them, uh, but not in a fundamentalist way. Um, and um, and uh, a lot of near-death experiencers develop a capacities that might that have been referred to in some religious contexts as gifts of the spirit. For example, they may see the future, they may converse, uh, communicate with deceased entities and other non-material entities. Um, so, um, so it can have some very um, pervasive effects on their lives in that way. And then um, physically, a lot of near-death experiencers need less sleep. They may change their diet. Many become uh, vegetarian, but not all, because I have one NDE or friend who has to have meat every day. Uh, so, you know, um, but, um, and uh, an interesting physical aspect that kind of is physical slash spiritual is that they, um, uh, electronic devices in their vicinity malfunction. 
And we know from research that they report this happening significantly more than other people, where cell phone calls drop, computers crash, and other kinds of electronic things happen. It can be scary if you're in a, an airplane, something goes a little wrong, you get frightened because we know from research that emotional arousal increases this, uh, these electromagnetic effects. And the fear results in all the dials going just going down. So the person has to um, quickly calm themselves and then everything comes back up and they figure out how to get out of the situation. But, you know, it can be, it can actually be life-threatening. Um, and, um, uh, you know, lights flash. Um, a lot of NDEers talk about the experience of walking down a dark street with uh, street lights. And as they approach each street light, it goes out. And then when they pass, it comes back on, but then the next one goes out and that sort of thing. It's, it's just something in their energy, their energetic body or whatever has an effect. Um, and we know again, that it is exacerbated with emotional arousal of any kind. It doesn't matter whether it's anger or elation, uh, emotional intensity seems to exacerbate these electromagnetic effects. And then the last category is social. So all these things we've talked about affect people's social lives. Um, if someone is married at the time that they have a near-death experience, they have a much greater likelihood than the typical person of getting divorced, not because they um, have, you know, they're like more negative or something, but because we, we know that it's because their values change. Um, when people marry, they tend to have similar values, at least in the Western world. And then if somebody has an NDE and their values shift in the ways that we've talked about, their, their values diverge and those people divorce. Um, but there are a few cases where the other partner had a little bit more NDE-like values. So when this person has their NDE, it actually brings their values closer their values converge and those couples continue happier than ever. So um, a lot depends on whether the effect of the NDE on the experiencer's values diverge them or converge them with their, with their partner. Um, we also know that um, based on that, uh, not want, wanting to be caring and not do harm, a lot of NDEers become nonviolent because they know that any violence that they perpetrate, they're doing to themselves. Um, so people who were involved in um, uh, jobs that involved some you know, potential violence tend to leave those jobs and go into um, more uh, like caring professions, like um, teaching, nursing, um, hospice work, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Wow, these are all amazing after effects of near death experiences. Yeah, that is so fa fascinating, you know. And normally you just hear about, you know, people are, you know, wanting to feel closer to that loving feeling or closer to spirit mm -hmm. or, um, you know, a lot of the basic ones that you uh, mentioned or seeing spirit because that veil is a little bit down now right. or, um, what was the other one that you mentioned? I was like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> God, now there was so much there. Yeah. Um, yeah. God, that's so uh -huh. fascinating. Yeah. Thank and you, you know, um, despite all these positive changes, mm. research suggests that it can actually take sometimes uh, or on average years for someone to really integrate the experience because it is so different from anything that they were prepared for or expected. And, and the experience is just so foreign to the way that we live in this dimension. So, um, and um, that the process of integration can be painful because, uh, for example, divorce, even when the people understand what's happening, it's still very painful, you know, to, mm -hmm. to tear to lives apart and um, if there are children involved in all of that. Um, and uh, people, like I had a, um, a gal come to consult with me who since her near-death experience, um, she kept seeing dead people 
uh, wanting her wanting her to convey a message to a living person that they knew. And so they were putting her in the role of a medium. And she'd never experienced this before her NDE. And now they were coming and visiting her at all times of the day or night, uninvited, interrupting her sleep. She was having sleep deprivation. She was struggling with you know, what to do when she didn't know the deceased person, she didn't know the living person. And is she supposed to, you know, do this thing? And so she had to learn how to set limits and, um, and how to work through the kind of moral question about how much she was responsible for doing. And, um, and it was just that aspect of the after effects was challenging. So um, another gal, um, foresaw the future uh, all the time and even in very mundane ways, like at the time she was waiting tables. And one day she saw that in a few hours, she would be standing at a table, saying something to a customer. Out, outside the windows, uh, a man would walk by with two poodles and just then someone would call her from the kitchen and, and ask her something. And so she's going through her day and, and suddenly, boom, there she is. She's saying something to this person. There's the man with the poodles. And then the person calls her from the uh, kitchen. And, and it was very distracting to her. So she, she essentially asked for this to stop. Um, and uh, then later, years later, when she had really integrated her experience more, she said to me, I think I'm ready now for it to open back up. Uh, but in manageable ways, so I can, you know, learn how to manage it and still live effectively uh, on this plane. Yeah, right. That would be like learning how to live your life all over again, like yeah. from a toddler, right? Because it's a new experience. So how do you integrate this new experience of living life into your life? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, because it it really opens up a, a fundamentally different cosmology view of the cosmos and your place in it and so then then you need to rethink your whole life in light of that new perspective yeah yeah it can be really challenging mm -hmm. Jeez, I bet and how wonderful that you're able to work with these experiencers you yeah. know and kind of coach them through mm -hmm. it what are the some of the things that they, I know you've, you know, shared a couple stories, but can you share a couple more stories about things that people have experienced post and how they manage that for maybe some of our listeners who didn't realize that they had this experience and could use some of this information to help acclimate a little bit better? Yeah, well, actually, something I've already mentioned, I found is the thing that near-death experiencers most often don't connect that um, it, it started happening after their near-death experience, and that's the electromagnetic effects. And um, I've had so many near-death experiencers when we get on to, when I get on to talking about that after effect that some NDEers, not all have, um, they'll, I can just see the wheels turning and they'll go, this explains so much. One young woman uh, was living with her boyfriend and when we got onto the topic of electromagnetic effects, she said, oh, that's why. She said, we got a new TV a few months ago. And my boyfriend complains that when I, only when I'm in the room, the TV flips channels and the volume goes up and down and nobody's touching the remote. And he says, it only happens when I'm there. And that is the electromagnetic effect. So, um, so that's one. And, um, you know, otherwise, it's really just, I mean, some people really struggle with the um, extent to which they do not want to engage in violence. Um, if it has been a family ritual to watch TV together every night, so many of our TV programs have violence in them and near-death experiencers sometimes uh, cannot tolerate watching that. It just is too upsetting to them. And so, um, so then they aren't wanting to participate with the family in this family ritual and then it creates you know problems within the family and a sense of disconnection so um so just all kinds of things can all kinds of ramifications can come from from the after effects 
Right. And I'm sure that if they don't know what happened or why they're having these experiences, they could have, you know, people coming with explanations of all sorts that don't even make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can happen. And, and another thing that happens uh, not infrequently, because I actually have done research on this, is that uh, when people um, disclose a near-death experience to a healthcare provider, now this might be medical, mental health, uh, spiritual or religious, like a chaplain or clergy person, um, the, health, the, men, the health provider can respond in ways that are helpful or harmful. And um, helpful is to recognize that what the person is describing is a near-death experience and offer that uh, term, not force it, but say, you know, it sounds like you might have had a near-death experience. Acknowledge the potential impact of the experience. Don't pathologize it because there is no justification from research to associate near-death experiences with mental disorder. And don't demonize it because there's no justification for considering it evil or of the devil. And in fact, just the opposite in um, for people who are Christian oriented in the Bible there in the New Testament, there's a passage about what uh, it's kind of a litmus test for spirit, what experiences derive from Holy Spirit. And the passage says that if an experience produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, then it comes from Holy Spirit. And there's just no arguing that. And eventually that is what near-death experiences engender. So there's no reason, uh, there's no basis from research to demonize the experience. Um, and so if instead the um, health professional recognizes says, you know, there's a potential that this experience could have a profound impact on you in some um, subtle and not so subtle ways. Um, there's no relationship between this and mental disorder, so you don't have to worry about that. And, um, and these experiences usually are psycho-spiritually advancing for people. So the, the um, key is to approach the experience uh, with the intention to draw from it uh, any psycho-spiritual development that, that you can, knowing that, um, that understanding and acting on some of those things is not always going to be easy or fun necessarily, but, but more meaningful and gratifying in a deep sense. Oh, those are great. So great. Yeah. Is there anything else that you would recommend for people who have experienced this and want to learn more? Well, um, one topic we haven't gotten onto yet is the phenomenon of veridical perception. And so um, to back up, you know, as I said, ND ears come back with these messages about loving and learning and, and that have implications for everything from our moment to moment decisions to global um, policy. Um, decisions. And, uh, but in order for people to believe in the validity, they need to believe that NDEs are more than a subjective personal experience. Now, sometimes NDEs are shared between two or more people, but that's relatively rare. Um, and, but um, there is this phenomenon where the person during their NDE perceived something or came to know something that based on the position and condition of their physical body, everything they knew or could even imagine, they shouldn't have been able to perceive or know. And yet afterwards, when they report it, um, it it's verified as accurate. And um, so an example is a woman is in surgery. She um, unexpectedly flatlines. And uh, over the course of a few minutes, the, the medical team uh, succeeds in starting her heart again. And uh, they finish the surgery. Of course, this whole time, she's been fully anesthetized. Her eyes are taped shut. And you know, that like what happens when we're fully anesthetized. They take her to post-op. She regains consci physical consciousness. 
um, and her surgeon comes to check on her. Um, and she says, I know that I died during the surgery. And he's like, what? And because he's worried about getting sued, right? And, um, and she says, yeah, she says, I was above the ceiling, looking through the ceiling. And I could see, you know, you did this and this person did this. And then this man came in with this machine and then he left. And so the only time that person was there was when she, her heart was stopped. And after 20 seconds of no heart rate, no breathing, there's no measurable brain activity, but she was perceiving and she could accurately describe this person who came and went. The surgeon was just amazed, which he shouldn't have been. If he knew anything, he should have known that this is, you know, fairly common. But um, the bigger part was, she said, yeah, and while I was up above the ceiling, I could not only see through the ceiling, but I could see through the adjacent wall. And in the operating room next door, they were amputating a man's leg. And when they finished, they put the leg in a yellow plastic bag to dispose of it. And so um, I saw the surgeon interviewed online that it's gone now uh, online, unfortunately. But what he said was, I don't know what's going on in the other operating rooms. I don't pay attention. But he said at this point, it was a couple hours after the surgery. So I went back to hospital records and confirmed that in fact, while I was doing the surgery on her next door, they were amputating a man's leg. And I said, I was never, I've never been in that operating room because it's specialized for amputations and I don't do that. But at this point, moment, it was empty. So I went and peeked inside and there I saw the yellow plastic bags they use for disposing of amputated body parts. So um, here, here she knew things that even her own surgeon didn't know, you know, specific details that had nothing to do with any expectations or, or anything she could have imagined and yet was verified as accurate. So there is um, a collection of over a hundred cases like this in a book called The Self Does Not Die. So for people who are interested in reading one case after another, and most of the time the, the uh, verifying party is a surgeon and people tend to believe physicians, you know, and these are, these are physicians and surgeons from all over the world, not just the US, but there are cases from France and you know, just all over the place. So um, it's a it's um, very um, uh, evidential that although most near-death experiences are purely subjective and can't be verified, um, those aspects that can be verified are often, in fact, um, I did a study to, to see if um, there were cases where people said they perceived things that turned out to be inaccurate. And the, um, it was less than 5% of cases that had even a minor error in it, more or less. There was only one case, I think, that was completely wrong, and all the rest were completely accurate. Everything the person perceived was verified as accurate. So, um, so it doesn't seem like um, there's, you know, and I've never... There's a skeptics might say, uh, have said that, uh, well, a lot, if a physician, uh, if a patient reports something and then the physician finds out it wasn't accurate, they're just going to, you know, forget it um, or, and certainly not report it in, you know, an academic journal. But um, in all the years that I've talked on this subject, I've never had a physician say that they had a case where somebody reported something that was inaccurate. It just um, is rare, if not, you know, virtually non-existent. So it just really suggests then that the aspects of the experience that can't be verified also have some credibility. That then lends credibility to the message about loving and learning. And that then has the potential to um, affect our world in, um, in big ways, uh, but ways that would be um, resisted by uh, some people who hold power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gosh, that is amazing, Jan. Wow. That story is just amazing. And what you said after, and thank you for the recommendation for those of us, you know, who want to read about, you know, all these stories, because I think there are so many gifts that near-death experiencers share, have shared 
for people who have not had near-death experiences, right? There are so many gifts, so many learning opportunities, so much knowledge for non-near-death experiencers to learn from this information about life and how to live and how you impact the world, right? Yes, absolutely. And, And there's actually been research on how people who have not themselves had an NDE, when they study NDEs and learn about them, they uh, show some of the same after effects as near-death experiencers uh, that uh, psychologist I mentioned before, the uh, pioneering researcher, Ken Ring, he called it a benevolent virus that it, it kind of catches. Um, it's catching for people who study the, the experience. And, you know, a lot of people have had other transpersonal experiences that, for, for example, I, to my recollection, have never had actually a near-death experience, but I've had many other transpersonal experiences that um, enable me to recognize and, and um, resonate with what near-death experiencers report. So, um, so a lot of people can relate, even if they um, haven't ex- specifically had an NDE. I love that. Thank you for saying that. And we're coming to the end of our hour now. If people want to work with you or learn more about your research, how can they reach you or find out more information? What do you have to offer? Well, um, they can contact me directly at uh, my email is jan.holden at unt.edu. But uh, I would actually recommend that people go to the website of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. Um, IANS, because there uh, is a wealth of information about near-death experiences. Uh, there's a near-death experiencer registry, so people can read NDE accounts uh, on that website. And, um, and we hold a conference every year, and everyone is invited. Anybody who just has personal interest, even if they haven't had an NDE, Uh, they're welcome to come. And uh, I can say, I've just heard so many people say that that conference, there's something special. It's just like an energetic um, high to be around people who are like-minded and um, uh, around the themes of near-death experiences. So um, yeah, so there's, uh, and that uh, conference is coming up on Labor Day weekend. Uh, in Salt Lake City this year. Uh, But people who wouldn't want to or can't come in person can attend virtually. So so it's available to virtually anybody who's interested. Oh, that's great. It's so nice how this has kind of opened up the realm of being able to be there virtually when we can't make it in person. Yes, that's so nice. Yeah, it's one of the uh, the rose among the thorns of COVID <laughs> is that we learned the value of Zooming. Mm-hmm. Right? God, yeah. we really have. And it is yeah. valuable to be able to make us a worldwide collective, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jen, right. thank you so much. This has been so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for sharing all this valuable information. And I'd love to have you back to talk about, you know, more. You have a couple other topics that we've touched on that I would love yeah. to dive into. So thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure to host you. Same here, Liz. Thanks for having me. And thank you everyone for joining me. Again, I'm Liz Peterson and this is Raise the Vibe with Liz. Thanks for joining us. And you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Raise the Vibe with Liz. And if you would like to get in contact with me, my website is lizshealingtouch.com. Thanks everybody. And remember to get out there and raise the vibe. Have a great day. Bye.